Hi, it's been a while, hasn't it? Welcome to Brady's Blunders, where I show you the mistakes in my games, hoping you don't make the same ones in yours. And today, I really mean it, and I don't think you'll make this mistake. So this is my second time recording this video. I recorded a, the whole thing yesterday on my trusty MacBook Pro that's a few years old. And unfortunately, uh, it's been glitchy and it's getting more and more glitchy. And when I reviewed the video, it was something like, Welcome to Blunders! Review! Game! And was just completely useless. So I've thrown that away and I'm trying it on a newer Mac, but one without a graphics processor. So we'll see how that goes. Fingers crossed. So before I get into today's game, let me talk about a few things. Uh, first, I actually want to apologize that I've been away. Uh, and of course, uh, as it would be, it's my fault, but maybe not in the way that you'd expect. You see, uh, earlier in the year, uh, and right around the time I made my last AlphaGo video, uh, I wasn't playing very well. Or maybe I was playing okay, but I wasn't winning. And I decided as a form of self-flagellation that I would, I said, that's it. No more videos until you win a league game. And uh, little did I know that uh, I wasn't just not winning very many games. I was actually starting an epic a streak of losses in these league games and I lost 11 in a row and I can only make this video now because I finally won a game a couple days ago. Yay! So uh, once again, sorry it's been a while since I've made one and uh, I don't think I'm going to make that promise to myself again because it didn't help. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to discuss is an interesting development and Three weeks ago, uh, YouTube notified me that I had a spike in likes on one of my videos. And I went and I checked it, and it was um, AlphaGo, whatever you do is wrong. And that was already my most popular video. So it was interesting that even though it was three months old, uh, it was getting a spike in likes. And I don't know what was the chicken and what was the egg, whether a few likes caused... Uh, YouTube to start showing it to more people or they started showing it to more people and therefore it got likes but uh, The video suddenly started to get reasonably popular like uh, you know mini Brady viral uh, you know not really viral, but for a go video it did all right and uh, Next thing I knew it had over a million minutes viewed in, in that small period and reached over a hundred thousand views and it was pretty cool but what's interesting is to get there, uh, YouTube made the decision to show it to non-Go players. And I'm not sure it was random public. I don't think so. I'm, I know that gamers saw it um, and by reading the comments. I suspect it might have been showed to some AI folks as well. Uh, that was less clear. Um, I don't think it was you know, generally shown to the public, but a much wider audience than my videos would typically get. So the two takeaways from that are, hi, welcome to all the new subscribers and, and viewers. I really hope you like Go, because uh, honestly, that's what this channel's about. And uh, if you don't play Go yet, but you think you might be interested, I'll tell you what, I'll add some links below to uh, hopefully give you access to either local clubs or online Go servers, and maybe some areas where you can learn about Go. Uh, and maybe uh, regular viewers can go ahead and give some more links to really great sites where you can learn more about Go. That would be great. And the second takeaway is for content creators, other Go content creators and wannabes, which is what can we learn from this? Uh, obviously, we're in a somewhat unique time in that AlphaGo is kind of interesting uh, to the more general public, uh, and that could be, and, and almost surely is, what drove the views for that video. But uh, it was the fact that the video was interesting to more than just Go players. And what can we do with our content that has greater appeal? Because what I'd really love to do is help grow this game that we love so much. So if you guys have ideas on videos that not I can do, um, but that we can do, or even ideas beyond videos. How can we uh, just, yeah, appeal to non people who don't know yet that they love Go? 
And again, I look forward to the comments. So the third thing I'd like to talk about is AlphaGo and its upcoming match in China. And I'm sure all of you know about it, but just in case, um, Google's DeepMind business has created an AI, artificial intelligence, called AlphaGo that seems to be stronger than any human. And last year, it shocked the world by beating Lee Sedol, the one of the strongest players in the world. And this year, it's challenged the number one player in the world, who's a Chinese 20-year-old named Kujie. And it's going to be very exciting to see. Those two are going to play three matches. And that's the headline. And there are several things that I'm looking forward to from that. And the first, just as in the earlier matches, is what new moves is AlphaGo going to show us? Uh, some concepts that we can learn from that we can apply to our own games. And that will be really interesting. Uh, hopefully there's something new. And along those same lines, uh, it will be interesting whether or how different this version is uh, versus the version of AlphaGo that played in December and January. Uh, that version, similar to the one from last year, was based, uh, its initial learnings come from games of humans against humans. And there are rumors that AlphaGo, uh, that DeepMind, has a version of AlphaGo that's self-taught that has no human interference in its play, if you will. And it would be really cool if we got to see that one. I doubt we'll get to see it if it's not stronger than the, than the, the version that trained on human games. So anyway, that's going to be interesting. The other thing that I'm really interested in seeing is Kujie's special strategies. And I mean, I'm, I, I doubt he's just going to say, all right, I'll just play a normal game. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just play my game. Well, maybe he will. He's a proud young man. Uh, uh, but I suspect he will try three different approaches in the three games. And what sort of special strategies uh, am I talking about? Well, an example is creating a fight with between two groups, neither of which are alive, and both have uh, lots of liberties. Creating a situation which humans are really good at. You see, AlphaGo is known for always looking globally and finding the best move globally. But in this situation, the rest of the board doesn't matter. If you've got a fight of 40 stones against 40 stones, uh, whoever wins that fight is going to win the game. And humans are very good at then looking at that situation and counting out the liberties and saying, this one's got 42 and this one's got 43, but it's got a trick move that actually adds to. So, um, and, and being able to look at a big complicated fight and knowing the exact answer. Uh, and perhaps this approach would work against AlphaGo. I wouldn't bet on it, but perhaps. Uh, another idea that people are talking about is you know tarting, starting two simultaneous codes just to confuse AlphaGo. I actually don't think either of these approaches will work because I don't think AlphaGo will agree, right? The idea with the really big fight is that both players agree to fight. And AlphaGo is known for not always agreeing to fight. If it thinks it has the lead, it looks for the simplest solution and the simplest path to victory. So just because Kujie says, I'm going to cut here and let's get it on, doesn't mean that AlphaGo is going to say, okay, yeah, let's fight. That looks like fun. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I'd bet against it. The only way that AlphaGo would agree to that, I think, is if AlphaGo believed it was behind. So, but it will be fun to see. Other interesting ideas are unusual openings. Uh, I remember watching a Hajin Lee video where she played, uh, what's it called? Um, oh, the black hole opening. And the first four stones by black were played on the seventh line. And the advantage of this approach, potentially, against AlphaGo is you are playing moves that it doesn't hasn't seen a million times in its database. And I know it's not structured in a database. Please don't flame me in the comments and saying you just don't understand. But um, its learning is based on looking at billions and millions of games. And if almost all those millions and millions of games are based on conventional openings, then of course it's going to be really good at those. So perhaps playing a different opening uh, that's we would consider suboptimal might be optimal against AlphaGo if it doesn't know how to handle it. And if it's, more importantly, if it's improperly evaluating uh, 
the situation. And like, maybe it thinks it's got a 55% chance so to win, so it doesn't accept the fight that Kuji offers after that. But it turns out the game was about even, and it should have accepted the fight. I don't know. This seems to me an opportunity. Uh, I hope, I really hope we see an unusual opening from Kuji. Anyway, that's just the headline. There's a few other cool matches that are coming up as well in this series. Uh, one of which is AlphaGo against five top Chinese pros. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I can see two arguments on this. And one is that actually the five pros will be worse than just one top pro because at least the one top pro, all of his moves will be harmonious. They'll be working together. Uh, and he'll be looking at the board he's way uh, he's used to looking at the board from, right? So it's consistent. And whereas when you have five people, all of a sudden you've got different ideas conflicting and different viewpoints conflicting and maybe not enough time to work through the differences. Seems like a valid point. On the other hand, uh, maybe five players will be better uh, because it will help overcome any biases. You know, if you put a territory-oriented player and an influence-oriented player together and a third player gets to hear both of their ideas, um, maybe he will be able to choose the best course of action um, that uh, between the, the two ideas that the two of them suggest. So maybe it will create um, a better balanced player, something like AlphaGo. Uh, I guess the other big advantage of having five players on a side is that creates five opportunities for genius at every move. If it's one player, it's one opportunity for genius. If you've got five geniuses looking at it, five opportunities. And maybe a little bit of genius is what it's going to take to beat AlphaGo. So that'll be fun. So the third game in this match that's coming up is actually really cool. It's going to be Pergo, in which uh, one top human pro pairs with uh, AlphaGo, and then another top human pro pairs with AlphaGo. So you get AlphaGo on both sides, and they each alternate taking moves. So it might go human, AlphaGo, AlphaGo, human. And obviously there's no communication uh, between the teammates, right? So the, the human can't see what AlphaGo is thinking of playing, and nor can uh, AlphaGo see what the human is playing. They just both have to re react to each other's moves. And what I'm really looking forward to about this is I want to see what the version of AlphaGo that believes it's losing, I want to see how it behaves. Uh, does it get very aggressive? Does it play a move that's so aggressive but unusual that its human partner doesn't even know how to, to answer uh, or to follow up? That's going to be interesting. And furthermore, I just want to see if DeepMind has solved the Monte Carlo bot tilt function. And that we saw in game four of the series against Lee Sedol that all of these bots, when they feel behind, they start to play really crazy moves, or at least moves to, uh, moves that look really crazy to us that just make it get further and further behind. Um, so I would like to see if, if DeepMind has solved this. Hopefully the, uh, the partner of the losing AI doesn't resign too soon before we can see that. Now, I did hear an interesting or see an interesting rumor on the internet today, and that is that um, the Chinese government has uh, put its foot down and said there can be no broadcasts of this match, this series. So that worries me. Uh, worry about how Google's gonna react. Hopefully it doesn't affect us. Hopefully it doesn't affect anybody. Enough intro. I guess I've been gone for a while, so I had a lot to say. Actually, I've got a few more things I want to say, but we'll get to that later. Uh, let's look at this game. So I mentioned that I was on, uh, that I had an 11 game losing streak of league games, not just casual games. And uh, it was incredibly frustrating. And this game is representative of those losses. Actually, that's not really fair. It's not representative. This is the worst, the best and the worst of those games. This is the game that I probably played the best and the most frustrating loss. So this game was so bad that uh, when it was done, I made a comment to my opponent. I said, oh, I have to go get a beer now. And when the reviewer went through the game, he said, oh, Brady, uh, beer is not enough. You need vodka. Uh, this was really bad. So, uh, so this is the vodka game.
So before I get into how the game fell apart, why don't I talk about where the game went right? Uh, because honestly, this was the best game I played this year, even though it was a loss. Uh, and this is uh, my favorite sequence of this year by far. And I'm kind of happy with it. So where we're at is both my opponent and I misplayed a Joseki in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, but as a result of both of those misplays, uh, I got, I think I got an advantage. And that is all of my stones are outside. And she took the corner but she took it relatively small and it actually gave me two additional stones on the outside. And you can see that I'm building up a really large territorial framework. Uh, and she responded by jumping in here. And when I saw this move, I thought it was perfectly reasonable. Uh, it, can, it can either connect underneath or, or run out towards the center. So it didn't, I didn't see a way that I could punish it right away. Um, and let's make this the game problem. If you were black, where would you play now? Now, I'm going to give a hint. So if you'd rather not see the hint and just think, on, think of it on your own, uh, go ahead and do so. Pause now, and I'll be right back. Okay, so now I'd like, uh, for the hint, I'd like you to ask yourself the question, where would AlphaGo play in this position? And that's all the hint I'm going to give. Right, go ahead and pause if you want to think about it, because I'm going to go ahead and show uh, how I play. All right, so first let me qualify by saying, I don't know that this is the best possible move, and maybe AlphaGo would play something completely different, and maybe you found a better variation too. But the variation I played worked, and it worked nicely. And when I first when I first looked at this position, I, I had three priorities. And the first was, I want to make this stone here useful. And uh, this is the stone that a white is sort of surrounding, but actually it's splitting white. And my initial thought of making it useful is make sure that white can't connect to his friends over here. But that wasn't my only priority. And the second that I was thinking about is, actually, I've still got this really great territorial framework and I'd really like to find a way to expand it. So that was my second. And then my third is, whatever I do, I don't want to hurt this group because I've actually already hurt it a bit in that uh, there are no eyes here and it is a cuttable shape. So I just wanted to make sure that you know, I'd, whatever I did didn't hurt this black group. Maybe I could even find a way to help it. And my first thought ran to something like this, just because this move splits this white stone from the others. But white could run lightly like this, or white, white could even move out like this. And as I make white run out this way, uh, the development of this territorial framework on the right is going to get undermined. And white's going to be able to later jump in, and I won't be able to make it as big as I'd like. So I quickly discarded this option. And that's actually when I said, well, okay, the option that I would think doesn't work, so hmm, where would AlphaGo play? And inspiration struck, and this was the solution I came up with, which was an AlphaGo shoulder hit. Now, normally we don't like to, sh to contact stones that are weak, that we want to attack because it makes them stronger. But, and, I, and I'd say that's probably true 90% of the time. But I think this is one of the 10% where it worked real well. And uh, white moved out here, and then I covered. So this move is developing this whole area for black, but it's also putting a lot of pressure on these two white stones. Uh, so she moved back, she covered this stone. Earlier I thought she might connect underneath, but once she started to move out, this is kind of her privilege, right? So she's getting some benefit from this as well, but I'm getting more benefit as I move down this way, and now the lower right is really becoming territory, solid territory, and again, uh, these two black stones, uh, two white stones have lost half their liberties. Uh, this stone here is breaking the bamboo joint, so it's a, it's a nice point to play on in terms of shape. Uh, so she fell back to here, and I covered. Uh, let's see, she played here, I played here, she moved out with this group, I Atari'd, and then played here. And I was really happy with this result. And so let's talk about why. Stone useful. 
And again, I thought I would use it to fight with, but instead I just, I decided to use it as a place where it's sitting on a really good point. And if my opponent plays somewhere else, at some point I can come back, push through, and that will capture these two stones because they can't escape because they're captured. So it's in a really good point. It's still a really useful stone. Uh, of course, my opponent wisely didn't do that um, because that's just points. I'm strong on the outside and that, th those points aren't really huge right now. Uh, my second objective was to continue to build my influence and grow the, upper, uh, the lower right over here. And you can see that this wall, it's just exuding power over the whole board. This was great. Mission accomplished. And then the third was I didn't want to hurt this group of stones. And beyond hurting it, it's actually connected, right? White can't cut here because I can capture that stone in the ladder. So uh, all three of my objectives were accomplished with that, that shoulder hit and then Hame on top. So it's not a typical shoulder hit sequence, but it's a case where the shoulder hit worked really, really well. So anyway, this was my best sequence I found so far this year. I'm quite happy with it. And the game continued to go really, really well. Anyway, my opponent wisely played here, growing her upper left, diminishing my center, uh, and the game went on. Uh, and eventually we got to this point. And there's a proverb. I sometimes say proverb, which is really awkward. Uh, there's a proverb that even a moron connects against a peep. And that's what this is. This white stone is threatening to cut, cut off this, uh, the tail stones that I talked about wanting to make sure we're safe. And even a moron connects against the peep. But in this case, there's two ways to connect against the peep. Uh, the most obvious is this, just, you know, she peeped and I connect and I'm fine. I've got a 20 point lead on the board. So the game is really, really good. Uh, but that's not what I played. And instead I played here, which I think is a better move. Uh, it reduces white's points here and puts pressure on this white stone. So it's going to make it easier for me to seal off this area. So I think this was the proper response to the peep, but there's a problem. And that is, uh, it doesn't fully or permanently resolve the situation. And later in the game, when she played here, uh, I didn't answer. And I can't tell you why. I wish I knew. So sometimes you're in a situation where your opponent plays a forcing move and you have time left on your clock. So you think, yeah, I'm going to spend a little bit of that time and look at other parts of the board. And then I'll come back and answer this forcing move. Right. That's and I and this has happened to me a few times where you do that and you kind of get so excited by what you read on another part of the board. or You think it's so important that you forget about the forcing move and you come back and, 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 and you skip it and you play, well, you know, that move that just excited you. And the opponent looks at you like, oh, dude, this was forcing click and crushes you. And I wish I could say that's what happened here. I don't think it was. I have no idea why I didn't answer this peep, but I didn't. Instead, I played here, and a few moves later, uh, she played here, and this game that was um, over 20 points on the board of victory for me turned into a very narrow loss. And uh, yeah, I was when this when this when this move was played, I just went berserk at myself, really, really frustrated. Like, you know, oh, you're on a losing streak and you just played a brilliant game and you just gave it away. And it was, yeah, it was frustrating. And I guess one of the reasons I'm sharing this tale is I'm sure it will happen or something like it will happen to you and just know that eventually you'll get through it and also know that you're not the only one. This happens to everybody. And when the when, and matter of fact, that was also the point that the person who reviewed the game for me, uh, Chi Min, he's a former Insei uh, and Seven Don in Europe. Uh, so when he reviewed the game, he said, um, yeah, have some vodka and just know that this happens to us all. Uh, and uh, in effect, get over it. <laughs> so there you go this was kind of the best of times the worst of times game i played great but i still managed to find a way to give it away 
And this is uh, what we call a true Brady blunder. And yeah, I guess that's it for this one. And thanks for watching. I hope the video worked and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.